So good evening once again. Welcome to Mind Your Own Black Business. Um, as you know, this is a show that airs every Tuesday at 8 p.m. BST, which will then change well to GMT, but the time will remain the same. Uh, my name is Ade Shikoya. I'm your host for this show. And if you haven't been with us before, the purpose of this show is for us to discuss some of the challenges that we see that are impacting the UK black economy. But even though we focus on, or we speak about some of the challenges, the focus is really about solutions. Um, I don't know about you, but I think as a community, we are great at complaining about things and talking about things. So the intention is rather than us demonstrating how much we know about the problem, it's really having a discussion which will enable us to come out or up with some potential solutions of what we can do differently to create some of the change that we say that we want to see in the world. And today I'm very honored, very honored to have somebody here who, for me, is like an encyclopedia. In fact, I say that if there was to be a Google on black history, it would be called Warner because this guy just knows so much stuff about so many things. He is a historian, a writer, a researcher, a founder of Black, His black History Walks. Is it Black History Walks? Um, black History Walks. Um, but let me first of all welcome Tony Warner to the show. Hey, Tony. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Hey, thank you for coming because I know that you're a very busy person. Uh, but before we continue, can you just tell some of the re uh, listeners a little bit about who you are and how you've come to the point that you are today. All right, um, I run Black History Walks and what we do is we run Black History Walking Tours on the African History in London um, each month all year long and we have 12 different walks in 12 parts of London, North, East, South and West. But apart from doing the, uh, the, the walking tours, we also, we also deliver films. So we have a agreement with the BFI South Bank at Waterloo, and we show films on black history every month of the year for the last 13 years. And it's the only cinema in the country to actually do that, to actually have a, a dedicated space of three to four hours to show a film plus have a QA. It's the only place in the country that does that. So we've done it for 13 years. And apart from doing the walking tours and the films, we also have talks and presentations. So we used to do them physically in you know, lecture fairs and venues like that, but now we're doing lots of stuff online. And the topics can cover from World War I, World War II, to superheroes, to Black British civil rights, to medical apartheid, to fibroids, to sexual health in the Black community. Also, we do all sorts of stuff. And the, and the talks take place, again, roughly two or three times a month, all year long for the last 13 years. So it's walks, talks, films. And we also do Black History bus tours, three hour bus tours around London to show people the Black History from a double decker bus. Okay, and wow. we, have, we have a three hour Black History river cruise too. So we have a a boat that goes from um, Westminster down to Greenwich and back, three hour journey. And we take people on this journey. We show the, the black history on either side of River Thames and also on board the boat, we have actual characters from African Caribbean history. So we have people in period costume dressed up as the characters. We have mm -hmm. a general um, Toussaint Louverture. We have Nanny de Maroons. We have Warwick Minya Santua. We have Queen of Madarinas. And each of the characters tells their story as we go up and down the river as well. So it's quite a, it's quite a big deal. Um, so it's walks, talks, films, bus tours, river cruises, and we've teamed up with a guy called Nubian Jack to erect plaques to famous black people. And we've okay. got three plaques so far, Harold Moody, Emma Clark, and Phyllis Wheatley. And we have about 20 more to go. So that's what we do in a nutshell. Okay, awesome. Great stuff. So, um, I mean, let's get straight in there. So I heard that you do Black History Walks and, and you mentioned in the city. Now, I work in the city and maybe some of the other listeners also, they, they work in the city as well. Um, and let me put it politically correctly, uh, Black people are underrepresented in the city today. So out of interest, like, why would you take people into the city in regards to Black history uh, since we're underrepresented today, surely we were upper, underrepresented back in the days too, or are you just taking people down there to make a statement? Uh, no, we show people the black history in there because there's history in the St. Paul's bank area that goes back at least 2,000 years. I'm talking about black people who was here 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years? 2,000 years ago, I can prove that fairly easily. And we okay. show people some of that evidence. We show people 
where the Romans had their encampments. We showed them the old wall. We showed them the evidence of the African presence of being here going back 1,800, 900, 2,000 years. Uh, we give names and details. But we also talk about how that place that we call the city of London, the area known as Square Mile, is literally full of and built on African Caribbean resources and people. And we show, well, for example, let's go to the Bank of England. Bank of England <laughs> right, okay. was previously or should have been known, was actually had a nickname of the Bank of the West Indies because they made so much money from the Caribbean, from sugar, from, um, from rum, etc that was taken out of the Caribbean and then sent back to the Bank of England. And that's not to talk about the gold in the Bank of England because the Bank of England had a coin called the Guinea coin, which was made from solid yeah. gold. And it was called the Guinea coin because the coin itself was made from solid gold that came from the Guinea coast of Africa, which is what we now call Ghana. And of course, you know, Ghana used to right, okay. yeah. So the Bank of England literally had money that was named after the African area in Africa where it came from. So that's how intimately involved um, Africa is with the, the city of London because the bank was literally using money that it could only get from Africa. Therefore, they called it after an African uh, area where they got it from. Uh, okay. and, that's, and that's just a piece of the story. There's, there's more to it. Okay, well, so what I'm hearing there is um, the Bank of England uh, was prominent in the slave trade Yep. that they benefited it and that they even went as far as having a coin which was named after the region where they got it from because of the specific type of gold. What other banking institutions may have been involved or benefited from slavery? Let's just call it what it is. Well, what other just, institutions may just, have just, from you it? just pick one. You're talking about Barclays, Lloyds, being Barclays Bank, Lloyds Bank. Um, well, if I talk about Lloyds London Insurance, so Lloyds of London Insurance, which is based in the city area, St. Paul's Bank. Yes, here, yes, 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 yes. That, they it. start off insurance slave ships. So when the people were taken from Africa to the Caribbean, Lloyds would insure the cargo as it was seen at that time. So if the cargo was lost or damaged, then the ship owners would get their money back. So Lloyds right, okay. literally made millions, if not billions, from African people. Now, if you go to their website, it doesn't mention that at all. It says they were involved in the sugar industry. But basically, sugar equals slavery. So anytime you see sugar, it means slavery. But that's that's how the history is whitewashed and kind of covered up. Because, like I said, Lloyd's literally now is one of the biggest insurance companies in the world. But their okay. foundation is literally on African people's bodies. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's interesting. I was watching a video the other day, which well, actually earlier on today, where I think it was Lloyd's, their usual public statement about how, you know, they don't support racism and they apologize for what happened whenever back in the days but they never really benefited directly and i'm sorry and jog on moving on because that's yeah. what i, I had to interpret right i'm sorry about what happened in the past but fine business as usual well i mean what, what i mean put it this way the church of england was directly involved in slavery the church of england made money from slavery in that the church of england had a plantation or plantations in barbados um, okay. At that time, it was referred to the Society for the Propagation of Gospel. And on that plantation, they had slaves, obviously, but the conditions on that plantation were so harsh that you might live for seven years. So as an African person, if you got to the Church of England's plantation, you might live for seven years, after which they'd just gone buy a new one. The okay. money from their enslaved, exploited labor uh, on that plantation was then sent back to England to help to build and maintain churches here. So okay. the church itself was involved. I mean, so if you think that the church full of Christian people was involved in uh, abusing and exploiting and abusing people, African people, you can see that any business was doing the same sort of thing. And that money of course, of course. was extracted from the Caribbean, from Africa as well, and invested here in this country. Okay, awesome. So, so I mean, so we're hearing about the connections in regards to uh, the long history that Black people have in regards to um, the city of London. What are some interesting things that we might want to know about what's happening in London and what historically has been contributed to that space? Um, well, one of the guys we mentioned in the St. Paul's Bank here is a guy called Alade Equiano. Now, we know he came from what we kind of call Nigeria now, and this is a guy who freed himself. This guy freed himself from enslavement. Then he became a hairdresser. This, this is back in the 1780s. You've got a black man who's a hairdresser in London, right? Um, he travels the world, he's in, in the Royal Navy, and then he sits down and says, what can I do to help my people? So my man sits down and writes a book. The book is called The Interesting Narrative of Alaudi Equiano. 
becomes a best-selling book, it's republished nine times while he's, he's alive, so he, he becomes a business, business, businessman as well. But the thing about that is that the way he got his book published and written is that he did what we call it crowdfunding now, yeah? But back in the 70s, this guy went around to all of his rich white contacts, got them to put down a grand each, whatever, and with that money, he published the book, and then when the book became a bestseller, he paid them back. So this guy was an entrepreneur, an author, an abolitionist, and he freed himself literally from enslavement. And then actually he was also part of a group of men called the Sons of Africa. And all these brothers were out there marching, demonstrating against inequality back in the 1780s. So there's all these histories of people resisting, fighting back, kicking up a first and, and actually being good business people as well. Okay. So you spoke there about, um, I can never pronounce his name, Equiano. Equiano, right? My fellow Nigerian. But what I heard there was entrepreneurship. So and part of Circulate really is about how do we increase the number of times that money flows within our communities. That includes obviously entrepreneurship. So are there other or are there any prominent black entrepreneurs, business owners throughout history, which I'm sure they are, that we should be talking about, that we should be thinking about? Uh, there's 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 a bunch. Now let me give you a couple of names. So these guys, there's a there's a there's a there's three guys. Uh, actually, it's two guys who are the most famous, but they're they're called Dyke and Dryden, and Dyke and okay, Dryden. Okay. Yeah, there was actually three three of them together, but I forget the other guy's name. But Dyke and Dryden are well known because they were part of a of a hair company that was the foundation of the what we what we now call the Afro Hair and Beauty Show. You know, it's okay. a big, it used to be a big deal back up in the in the eighties, nineties. Yeah, Alex, Alexander Palace. And exactly all those right. Guys. Yeah. So these guys it, it were bit initially set up selling hair products, right? But then they were branched out into fashion shows and um, publishing and, um, and travel agencies, etc. So they had a whole kind of network. Um, it was a black-owned business um, focusing on the black community, but the money they made from their entre entrepreneurial business activities was then invested back into black people's activities. So they would sponsor Saturday schools, they would sponsor um, um, uh, sickle cell, etc. They would put their money back into the community so they wrote a book i'm trying to remember the name of the book now but it's dyke and dryden what was it called no, I can't. but anyway if you put in dyke and dryden book it will come up and these guys were doing their thing back in the 70s and 80s when it was much harder to do business than it is now um and they were making that money and they were putting it right back into the community in fact the afro hair and beauty show itself was a way of bringing the community together to generate business in the community and that is that's still going on now Okay, so we, we have that. So, so, so in a nutshell, I mean, obviously we want to start talking about the different ways that we could start actually generating businesses um, that generate more money, bring in more income. So I know you do some work around institutional racism. Yeah. What really, take away all the theory, all the academic terms, what really is it we're talking about when we talk about institutional racism and can you give some examples of it, of how it actually impacts on the UK black economy? Um, it's, the way, it's the way people think and behave, and, it's, okay. it goes, and, it's, and it goes unchallenged. For such a long time, people just think it's normal. Um, okay. And to give examples, we can think about the Windrush scandal, that the idea is that, well, basically because you're black, you can't really belong here, so let's deport you. I mean, in a nutshell, that's what it was all about, right? But that also goes back to the 70s too, because back in the 70s, there was actually a political movement to deport people who had been born here because they had my color skin. And they, this is actually debated, you know, in um, uh, high, high powered circles that, what can, how can we get rid of these black people? How can we deport them, even though they've been born here, to someplace else? And that was back in the 70s. So when I heard about the so-called hostile environment and Windrush scandal, it just reminded me of what happened before in the 70s and 80s and how people were actually, at one time, people were actually being offered money to, to go back, quote unquote, to where they came from. Um, how much? It was, it was rubbish money. It was like, you know, 800 pounds or something like that. It was ridiculous. It was really, it was a real insult. Um, but it, it kind of shows how this, this kind of cycle of looking at people who have a different color skin and then saying that they're not English, get rid of them, get them out of the country, they don't belong here, is is repeated um, over a period of time. Okay, so that's an interesting thing. I mean, we won't have enough time to really unpack racism today. But something that you said there about, you know, when um, 
back in the days and they're trying to debate that because of skin color people should go back home here's an interesting thing that i experienced and maybe some of the listeners and maybe you might have seen this as well which was during the brexit which was listening to some people with the same skin color as me talking about Eastern Europeans and everybody else in the same way that we were spoken about back in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Oh, you're going to come in taking our jobs. Oh, they don't do anything. Oh, they're just lazy. And we just yeah. go, wrong. Yeah. You know, look at yourself. Yeah, but I'm different. We're different. It's not the same. But then, I mean, yeah. it's so, is it arguable that sometimes we talk about racism because obviously we are at one side of the clear spectrum of it, but is it also argue that racism is actually innate in all human beings in different forms? No, I don't think it's innate at all. No, I think okay. what happened to some of those people you just mentioned there is that they, well, first of all, they, they didn't know their own history. That's, that's number one. And okay. then number two, it becomes like, it's like oh, there's a saying we have in England called, I'm all right, Jack, pull the ladder up, <laughs> which means once you're good, it's like you don't care about nobody else. So that's a bit of self, that's, you could say selfishness is innate to human characteristics characteristics but I'm not sure racism is um but yeah that's part of it is to pull the ladder pull the ladder up attitude plus is the fact I, I can tell you for a fact that most people have no idea of this history i'm talking about that's why we do the walks in the first place so we've had some people who, who who will literally say i've walked past this area for the last 25 years i never knew that this bank and this street and that person was living there had no clue because they were never told that and that was deliberate because if people knew this history, they'd be empowered and they'd actually act differently as well. Okay. So what I'm hearing then is it's more of a nurture type thing because, and for a lot, maybe even for a lot of our people, we don't necessarily understand who, where we are in this context. Would that be a fair way of putting what you're saying? I okay. So, so what, yeah. yeah, part of what you're doing is also doing the walks and stuff like that. So interestingly enough, I mean, let's, we talk a lot about slavery. Unfortunately, I don't have that. If I showed you it, you'd remember it. Right? Timeline. Timeline. Paul yeah. Binnett's timeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Paul Binnett's timeline. It's lovely. Yeah. I might rush in a minute and try and get it just to show some of the listeners what we're talking yeah. about, which is actually slavery is just a blip within the overall history yeah. of black people. Of course, in the West, we focus on it. And for mm. a lot of people, they form their, their identity around enslavement, whereas actually the truth is it's much bigger than that. Mm. But, Surely we should also start looking, or should we start looking at slavery as the economic system that it was? Well, I mean, yes, we should definitely look at it as an economic system because that's what it was. It was like making money for, for European people. But I should mention that when we do our walks and our talks, we always emphasize that there's been black history prior to enslavement. In fact, people are often surprised as to how tropical goes. So, for example, well, 2000, well, years, oh, yeah. 2000 years ago, this is long before the British get involved in what we call chattel slavery, where people are seen as, as pieces of meat. So 2,000 years ago, there were African people living here in England. We also know that for about 700 years in what we call Spain and Portugal now, up to the 1490s, that area was ruled by people from Africa called the Moors. So we know there are African people kind of running what we call Europe up to 1492. And we also know there are black people who are free living here in England in, fifth, in the 1500s because we actually have documents and pictures of them so there's a black history long before slavery we make sure we kind of emphasize that and show that but we do talk about how much money was made from this um slavery business and where that money money ended up and how that money connects to our modern day prosper prosperity okay great stuff so just for some of the listeners here's what we are talking about and here's the interesting thing i like about this timeline as well so here's the timeline okay you might not be able to see it really clearly. Yeah, um, not clearly. <laughs> I can see clearly. it's a big long thing. It's like six it's weeks just long, a right? Long, yeah, it's like long, 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 long thing, right? Yeah. And then somewhere in there, I was even struggling. I can't even find the point where slavery is. <laughs> yeah, you know, for the 1500s, <laughs> it's like three yeah, quarters of the way up. It's just like when you look at it, it's like really in comparison to everything else, really? Yeah. But, um, okay, so what are some of the things that we can do? We're talking about there's. Um, institutional racism how, how does it affect the black economy let's talk about like well like, it affects it in that you might find it more difficult to catch a loan not catch to get a loan you might okay. find it more, more difficult to actually um is that really true in today's world is that uh, still happening? well i've heard that i've heard that it can be difficult for black businesses to get loans okay. um, when it comes to training standards i've also no, no i've heard i know for a fact that training standards will sometimes come down hard on you than the white guy next door to you um, 
there might be an issue with regard to uh, publicity and marketing, but I suppose there are ways around because there's a whole bunch of people out there doing their thing right now, either selling food or clothes or hairdressing that are surviving and thriving. Of course, and to me, I think when we start unpacking it, we can actually see it goes deeper, even from the school, right? So we have kids who go into the school, they don't necessarily see themselves reflected in the system, um, they are more likely to get excluded, kicked out of school, which means they are less likely to get high, uh, to get the type of education, to get the type of jobs. They're going to be criminalized by the criminal justice system. Uh, they might end up with a record or low in paying jobs. All of these things will then contribute to single parent families, families being split up, which might lead to some of the youth crime that we're seeing or all these other things. We haven't got time to unpack it. But for me, it's really, really tied in because at the end of the day, especially if you exist in a capitalist society and the whole thing is, okay, you need to acquire certain things in order to be somebody within society, which we know actually as human beings, we're much more than that. However, if that's the carrot that's being fed, but then it's like, well, no, you can't sit at this table then of course it has a big impact on the black economy because also going back to your thing about loans and the fact that people might not necessarily be entrepreneurship or being able to access the funds to create businesses then we are in a position whereby we are not able necessarily to provide jobs for people who look like us mm. and that also has its all issues or what do you think do you think that there's something in that yeah i do and again speaking of the historical perspective i remember Back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, when it came to black people applying for loans from banks, they would often be refused point blank because they were black, which is what then led to the establishment of what we call the partner or the box on the SUSE system, which is basically black cooperative economics, whereby you get 10 people from the same uh, area or island or village will get together and say, okay, we're going to put down 100 pounds a week, and each week one person will get a thousand pounds and they'll go around the circle, and you could then use that thousand pounds to buy a house. So, back in what? 50, 60, 70, you could actually buy a three bedroom house for three grand, right? Now, once you bought that house, um, you, you, you're able to actually then rent out rooms and then, you know, put in a, a basement, put in some double glaze, in, put in, a, put in a toilet, et cetera, and improve the property. So there's a massive amount of entrepreneurship in uh, the black community in the UK in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s that led to people having houses. Actually, at one time, there was a higher rate of home ownership amongst the black community than the white community because the white community could afford to get a council flat because they could afford to get um, um, uh, rental properties. But for, for us now, because we was being ripped off when it came to rent, a lot of people were then forced to become entrepreneurs and they did. And that, that evidence is in people's houses right now. Okay. So what I'm hearing, would you, I've never, can never pr pr pronounce it. Partner, right? Partner is what that means. Partner, yeah, yeah. Partner. Okay. So since we had that basis, it seems like we had some form of economic foundation. Historically, what's happened? Now, I've heard it said many times and I look around and sometimes I see it evident that we are potentially going to be the first generation to leave less to the next generation than what was left, left to mm. us. Since we had a partner system in place that seemed to have worked quite well, and from my understanding, even the Asians took that on board, but not only did they do it to buy houses, they bought streets and then they bought businesses and they've done other things. Mm. What, what happened with us as a community? Well, I would definitely say there's been a lack of continuity with regard to that history and, and knowledge and practice being passed from one generation to the next generation. But at the same time, I know for a fact there are certain buildings and for example, there's a credit union in Croydon. I think it's the it's one of the oldest credit unions in the country that is black owned and was blackest um, black founded. If you want to use that term, right? And again, the name there scares me, but I know they exist because I just was reading about it the other day. But also, okay. I know that when it comes to black churches now, there's a church in Hackney. Um, it's just there by Dalston Kingsland Tube Station, and that church has been black owned since 1966. And it was actually a white owned church initially and they got together and bought it and there's a whole bunch of that in fact there's there's several churches like that that were white churches first black community got together bought them and they're still in black hands so there are some success stories out there they're just not that well known or documented and people don't can't refer to them because they never heard them in the first place so for example that credit union that's in croydon the name again oh, has gone out of my head but that that's a fantastic example of lack longevity in business and they're still very strong and it's set by, by these these um, caribbean people back in the, in the 50s 60s so there's the history is there it's just that it's it's not that well documented not that well known but isn't that part of the challenge wouldn't you say that actually there's these pockets of greatness which are happening uh, i'm a firm believer that what 
well, as you know from the 100, what they see is what they'll be, right? Mm. Now, if there are examples of, hey, here's what can be achieved, here's what's possible, then it inspires not even just people my age, and I'm getting there, but also <laughs> the youngsters, right? Yeah. The, young, the younger people to aspire to something. But isn't that part of the problem? And is that not also some form of institutional racism or the impact of what we're talking about here, which actually even the pockets of success, which could inspire people to create more of it, are hidden to the point that actually, I, yeah. we, I don't know about them, we don't know about them, so we can't even do business with them, we can't yeah. support them. How do you yeah, overcome that challenge? That's definitely part of the issue is, is there's not enough coverage or recognition or awareness of these success stories which is to some extent deliberate as far as the mainstream is concerned because like you say if you can't see it then you might not aspire to be it and if you can see it then you think yeah someone did it before me let me have a go and it's it's just it's just good to know you know what i mean it's like it's it's empowering just to hear information which is why it's so important to, for people to know their history okay so i i, I hear you on that one so as we start getting closer to the point where we start wrapping up what are some things that we as a community can start doing to turn the dial? And I'm not talking about from a passive point of view, right? I'm talking about what things can we proactively start doing so we can start ha reducing the impact of institutional racism on the black economy, start actually reaping some of the benefits potentially of the contributions that we made to the city of London. And rather than going with like a bowl in our hand or kind of begging or asking or constantly asking, what things could we do? I'm not saying burn down the city or anything like that, but what things can we actively start doing to actually rebuild our own communities? Well, we, could all, we could all list ourselves on circulate.co.uk, make sure our businesses are there. We can um, follow this radio show. We can um, buy books about business and entrepreneurship, in fact, my book is going to, you see the examples I, I mentioned, but I can't remember. They're in the book, right? It's just like you remember them right now, right? Um, we can, yeah, invest in history. Make sure you, you go to or attend events on history because this is where you're getting information that's been deliberately suppressed and covered up for decades, if not hundreds of years, because that history is empowering. Um, we can buy within our own community. So if we're going to, you know, I don't get it get something to eat outside we can go to your local jerk chicken man your local fufu man wherever it is that you can go you can go there as opposed to fish and chip shop so we, we all the stuff uh, that we should be doing uh, is kind of known more or less it's been written about we've had speeches on it we've had seminars on it it's just a question of actually doing that stuff that is already out there making sure we kind of don't just waffle and talk we actually physically do so i like what you're talking about there which is actually taking action uh, I don't shy away from controversy, so I'm just going to jump straight in. Like you said, you've been doing the films. I mean, I remember when it was both part of the 100, we used to come to those events, and you've been running these events relentlessly for years. One thing that we do know, for a number of reasons, once again, it may be because of the economy, it could maybe be because of people, uh, whatever's going on in their lives. A lot of our people don't have the time. I'm going to put it nicely. I so said, don't yeah. necessarily have the time to consume, to learn the things that they need to learn to empower themselves. Also, a lot of our people don't realize that they don't know what they don't know. So they're fine yeah. the way they are. Since you've already got a track record, you've seen the numbers more than me about how persistent and how hungry we are for these things. Do we need to start looking at alternative ways? Because, I mean, 13, 14, 15 years old, we're still... Alternative ways of what? Educating people or...? I don't know. I'm just saying, because we're saying... All of these things are readily available, the history, the things that mm. you do, providing that information, but people are not consuming it for whatever reason. It's no, mm. we're not trying to blast them or anything else. So doesn't that then suggest to us that actually we need to start looking at other ways that are going to activate people to actually start taking action? Well, my way is like kind of one-to-one. -one. Much as I organize events for hundreds of people, my, my way is always one-to-one -one because sure. I find that when you sit and chat to someone one-to-one, -one, have a conversation and say, well, why are you doing this? How have you not done this? When you, when you engage with them on their level about what the issues are, you can get some sort of movement or change. Um, and, and that is my response in that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a one to one thing that you do over and over again, and then it gets to be a movement. So, for example, when, when Ken set up the 100, he had like, you know, a few friends and he got them involved, then he got bigger and bigger. And now it's still going strong, like 20 years later on, it's got more guys than when he started off, but 
it wasn't a it wasn't an overnight thing, or well, not really. It wasn't overnight. Life wasn't overnight at all. It was like him knocking on doors and banging down bridges, not bridges, banging down walls and <laughs> pop, over and over again. And after a while, it kind of got to this snowball thing, and it's rolling on now. And he's you know chilling out now. He's not involved in longer, but he's he's he, that one guy got that massive ball rolling, and the ball is still rolling now, helping thousands of young people. I would have thought by now. Okay, so what I'm hearing there, of course, and we're going to have Ken on the show in a few weeks' time. He's going to be talking about health and the impact or how that relates to the black economy. But what I'm hearing in there is that each individual has got to become a catalyst. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Okay, and I guess we don't have, we spoke, I, I don't know if you watched the show we, we had with Paul the other day, we spoke about leadership in the black community. Actually, let me throw that out to you as well. What's your views about leadership in, in the black community in the UK? What do you mean by that? leadership what do we have leadership do we have prominent leadership because there's many things that are happening there's different boycotts there's uh reparations i can never pronounce it properly there's different things that are happening but it doesn't seem like it's strategically linked up it seems like we're just doing stuff so do yeah. we have leadership? do you think we need leadership in the uk well i think we do have leadership but i think it's kind of um What's the word I'm looking for? Bifurcated. It's like it's not it's not uh, homogeneous, which is a good thing because what happens if you have like a single leader is that often they get taken out or messed up or interfered with, right? So it's some sometimes it's good to have these different sections of groups who are leading themselves and doing their own thing because it makes them less um, viable to being dis disrupted. Um, and also, of course, the this flip side is that you can't see one set of persons doing what you might want them to do because they're all disparate but i think i think it might i think it might be a strength one of the weaknesses at the moment that there's there's different groups doing different things because that way you're less likely to be taken out as one individual okay so i get that but i also feel that there's a saying, and this comes from genghis khan he's not quite black but he's got color so we're going to take what he says anyway one arrow alone can easily be broken but many arrows are indestructible so right. This one of having separate things, and I guess for me that also when I look at it from a with my business hat on, it yeah. seems like there's a lot of duplication. There's a lot of people don't know about these things, so we're yeah. able to support it. Uh, there's people crossing over, yeah. which to me means we could be much more effective if we brought all of this together. So, for yeah. example, one of the things that you might be aware of uh, today, we launched uh, the Black Economic Empowerment on Facebook, so BEE UK, and the intention there is actually to get a mass number of Black people who may be interested um, in us then going to negotiate with the banks and financial institutions to say, hey, we've got this many black people who've got mortgages and loans. I mean, I, I think the, the figures at the moment say that there's 30 billion an annual year that we spend as a community, the black community alone, mm -hmm. right? Who knows how much of that is tied up in mortgages? And when we're talking about mortgages, we're talking about um, residential mortgages, we're talking about commercial mortgages, business loans, personal loans, credit cards, who knows how much of that money is tied up? So the intention of that group is actually to bring everybody together to actually then open negotiations with the banks and financial institutions to say, hey, give us preferable rates, give us preferable terms, and as a movement, we will come to you as collective 10,000, 20,000, and do business with you. Yeah. If not, we'll take our business somewhere else. Um, so I'm talking about, yeah, do, do we have leadership? So let me just, 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 you mentioned leaders. Maybe I'm disconnected from the UK side of things, but I'm struggling to think of anybody that I would say is actually a leader in the UK leading the black movement, if, if there is a black movement. Uh, maybe, maybe you could shed some light on it for me so I can just, maybe I've realigned myself with where that is. Mm, well, like I say, when you say leaders, people often think, tend to think about politicians, but I don't, nah, I think I, I'll, I'll just leave that on the moment when it comes to politicians. <laughs> but for yeah. community activists, you could talk about the guys who are running uh, Manhood Academy, the guys who are running um, The Hundred. The people who are doing. Um, we're gonna have, we're gonna have, we're gonna have Brother Davis on here next this, week this as well. So he's gonna be talking. Um, the people at um, the Winners Foundation, Patrick Vernon's, well, I would definitely call him a leader. Um, Arthur Toronto would be a leader as well. Um, DM Justin Barr just passed away. She was leader when she was in her prime. So there's all there's a, there's a lot of people out there doing their thing. So let me maybe let me. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I'm just going to throw it out there though. So when I, maybe I should have been clear when I said leaders. These all individuals are leaders and they're doing excellent things. Mm. Some of them are going to be on the show to talk about it. But I'm talking about that joined up thinking, that 
joined up leader. So I guess in my mind, when I'm talking about leaders, I'm thinking of your Nelson Mandela's, I'm thinking of your Martin Luther King's, I'm talking, yeah. I'm talking about your Malcolm X. Regardless of what you think about their policies and views, yeah, they yeah. Are loads of people in a one direction, not yeah. lots of people. And that's what I'm asking the question about, really. Yeah. Do we have well, that? I, Do we need one in the UK? To be more I strategic. Don't... I don't think you have that one particular person that's united a whole bunch of people around them to take people forward. But like I said, that kind of leadership might not be appropriate for the 21st century because as you, as you know, if you have one guy, he gets taken out quite often or he gets destabilized quite often. But if you have a whole bunch of people doing their own thing, it's more difficult to kind of mess them about. But it, it, it's, it, it would be easier for us, I suppose, if we just had one dude who was gonna say, right guys, let's do this. But that doesn't always work as we know. And I agree. And I think, and just to start wrapping up, I think in this new world that we live in, especially with digital technology, one leader is not necessarily just one leader. A good leader replicates himself so many times, just like a cell. So that actually, you know what, even if you do take out the leader, it still, the rest of the body can function. And, yeah. and I guess maybe that's, maybe just, that might be just me, but maybe we need to start thinking about it. And once again, I'm not talking about it from a violence point of view or anything like that, but I'm talking about more strategic joining up utilizing all the resources like you said you've got the manhood academy you've got um is it young leaders academy you've got the yeah. 100 you've got all of these organizations yeah. doing excellent stuff on their own imagine mm. what happens when you bring them all together yeah imagine the impact because i speak to some people and they're like 100 what do they do manhood academy who are they but imagine you have just one organization it's like boom you go there mm. bam all mm. of these guys just, I'm just wondering how much more effective would we be? Also, I mean, you mentioned before the circulate. There's loads of of directories that are popping up now, and I encourage mm. listeners join any of them. For me, I'm not I'm not precious about any of this. It's just really about the end goal. Is but how do we bring all of that together? And I guess maybe just as we start wrapping up, I'll ask a question: Is the fact that we have so many separate th- things or organizations in our communities doing the same thing but not joined up is that a result of colonization and slavery just to throw it out there I, I, well i wouldn't say that I okay would, i would say that you know if we think about other situations um you can have an umbrella group. That's a fact. That's happened before. So there was a group called the West Indian Standing Conference. This is basically a Black British civil rights group based in um, um, uh, Westminster Bridge Road. They're just by the actual bridge across the parliament. And they were a collective of different groups who all had the same similar sort of vision to fight against racial injustice. And they were looking at healthcare, police brutalities, education. Okay. And they were they do they were doing their thing for fifty odd years, and wow. it was it was different sets of people under this umbrella of the West Indian Standard Conference, and they they were active from the 1959 58 riots right up until Stephen Lawrence. They they have a bedded, they're they're actually in my book, but that that just reminded me, yeah, you can have that disparate u- okay. unity, Good. so to speak, where you have different guys doing the same sort of work, and they come together on an umbrella level and share resources and share ideals. And, and that way you can, you can do literally what you just said, which is combine their collective might into one purpose. They're still doing their own thing, but they have a kind of overall strategy to say that we're going to do this and take it forward that way. Because it has been done before. And that's another okay. learning point from history. Okay, great stuff. And that was going to be one of the things that I was going to ask you, you know, just based on, just as we start wrapping up, to draw on any lessons that we could take from history that we could use. Just before I ask you that last question, though, is that umbrella organization, who are they? Are they still in existence? Right. How do we connect with they them? They were called the West there. Indian Standing Conference. West okay. Indian Standing Conference, and they were active from, like I said, 58, with the Notting Hill riots, the racist riots in Notting Hill. Um, sure. Up until about 2010 or so. So they, they covered all the race relations that, they covered Stephen Lawrence, they covered um, Stop and Search, Sus, they, they did a whole bunch of work. And one the one guy who's still alive from that group is a guy called Clarence Thompson. That's his name, I think, Clarence Thompson. Um, I haven't seen him for a while, but he was one of the, the surviving members. But it was, it was, there was a whole bunch. Of, in fact, they have a website. If you just Google West Indian Standing Conference, 
look at their website, they list their names there, they list the activities there, and uh, that's a resource by itself. But they were doing a thing, and uh, as I said, they're actually in my book, and I got to track down Mr. Thompson. He's a Trinidadian, he came in back in the 50s, man, he's got, he actually opened a, a, a petrol station, a black man had his own petrol station in the 1970s, and it just made millions of pounds or whatever, and then he, he actually invested money in art, and he's got, he uh, was a chairman or trustee of the, um, the 198 gallery, man's a legend. I actually interviewed him for, for one of my events um, ages ago. But there's, like I said, there's stories like that that need to be kind of sure. documented and put down. Yeah. But we're well, in the Stanford Conference, they did the thing back in the day, so we should learn from them. Awesome, great stuff. I noticed that you spoke about the West Indian Standing Conference in a past tense. Yeah. Does that mean they no longer exist? Well, they did 50 years, brethren, so after a while, I suppose, um, um, they didn't get new members or they kind of came to okay. a natural conclusion. But 50 years is a good time. I mean, they were doing I get the thing. I get that. But what I'm hearing there is it sounds like that maybe as a generation and as we start wrapping up and start thinking more strategically, what I'm hearing from you is that there's lots of groundwork that was laid and for whatever reason, the baton hasn't been picked up. Good and so. in my, yeah, in my view, and this is just my personal view, just in most things is that, you know, each generation rebuilds on the shoulders of those who came before them. But if these guys have done all the hard work and it's just sitting down and then we're kind of yeah. going back and then starting to rebuild yeah. something yeah. that's already been built, then once again, that to me doesn't necessarily say that we're being strategic in utilizing what's being invested already, the blood, mm. sweat, and tears and the lessons that we can learn. So you've given so much information um, and I know I haven't been easy with throwing out some of my thoughts and questions, but I know you're a man who can handle that. So I appreciate that. Um, just before we start wrapping up, how can people get hold of you? I know you've got a book coming out, you've got a tour and some other bits and pieces. How can people reach out to you to connect with what you're um, doing? Well, the website is just blackhistorywalks.co.uk. So it's blackhistorywalks.co.uk. Then we've got Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and all the rest of it, the usual there. We do stuff each month. And the best thing to do is kind of go to a website and join the main list and that we get um, advanced notice every week as to what's happening in the future. Um, the book is titled Black History Warts in London, Volume 1. Um, and basically, if we have 12 warts, I've kind of combined 2.5 of the warts into one book. It's 90,000 words, it's about 230 pages. It's, it's basically looking at literally the black history in the streets of, of London, um, going back 2,000 years to modern times. We're looking at economics, politics, religion. We're looking at black British civil rights, looking at World War One, World War Two. We're looking at food fashion design it's all in this this one book because it's basically like i said the walks condensed into uh well volume one as uh, of the six volumes yeah. and it, it's just going to tell us a story that's not been told before in this way awesome and when when is that book going to be out it should be out in october from jacaranda books and actually jacaranda books is a all black female publishing house and they're publishing okay. 20 books by 20 black rich authors in the year 2020 Never been done before to have 20 books by black writers published the same year. And that that's happening this year. It's called 20, 20, 20. And my book is the is towards the end of the um of the 20. And it'll be out in a set, as I said, October, if not November, but from Jack Aranda Books. So your book is number one, because you're towards the end of 20. Well, I suppose number this is number 20 of the 20. <laughs> no, I'm like like your top, I meant number one as in. Uh, yes, of course it is. Yes, indeed. Exactly. It's sticking with me. All right. Awesome. Great stuff. So um, also, I mean, so just to wrap up, if there were three things or three lessons that we could draw from history and utilize it in today's world, because as you know, we're going through some massive change. We're in a yeah. world of great uncertainty at the moment. Um, if I'm going to be quite honest, when I look back historically at where there's been massive global change, change, for some reason, black people don't always do so well. Mm. I mean, depending on what you think about COVID, whether it's nature or nurture, even that affected us disproportionately. It's true. Okay? <laughs> so if we're at a time of change, something's happening, we don't really know what, what lessons can we draw from history that we can use in these moments of change to strengthen our position or at the least not make our current position any worse? Three things we can do to, well, first of all, I'd say do for self. 
Marcus Garvey, do for self. Don't rely on um, government handouts of people. Whatever you want to, whatever you want to kind of do, then you make sure that you use your own resources to actually make it sure. happen, and don't be expecting the handouts. So do for self, I would say, is number one. I would say network is number two. So I think networking, as you know, is really important because that allows you to kind of expand your influence and actually gain support. So I think networking is really cool. This is even right here in networking, because I'm on your show, I'm going to mention Circulate. You're going to come on, you know, a walk in the future as you did in the past. So that's all we're talking about. So about do for self networking and read. I would say read. People need to read. Read as much as you can, because this information is there, it's out there, it's just not that well known. But once we read, we can find out about it and then put it into action ourselves. Awesome. Now, once again, I really appreciate you taking your time out to join us and to share the information that you shared with us. Um, so thank you ever so much, Tony. And I'll be looking forward to seeing your book. I'll make sure I order a copy on the basis that you sign it for me. Yeah, I'll sign it. You know, I'll sign it. <laughs> thank you. No thank you very much. Okay, so once again, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. So to all your listeners, there you heard. So really the intention as we start going deeper with this show is really to start pulling out some key things for us to really start thinking about. The fundamental thing about this show is it's not about blaming anybody, but it's about also enabling us to look in the mirror and say, actually, do we hold the keys to the outcomes that we want? Um, we have our constraints, we, we get that, it exists, I totally get that. But I guess it's, it's really, do we get to that point right now where we actually just start utilizing what we have to create what we want? Um, I implore us to start really looking at that, especially the economics of things, whether that's through business, whether it's through the way that we shop, whether it's the way that we support or create jobs within our environment. But um, I think there's a time that's coming very soon where the world as we knew it, as many of you have already experienced this year, the world that we knew, knew before is changing very fast. And, you know, yeah, enough said. So there you go. Once again, Tony wanted to share some really powerful information with us. Do check out his website. Did you share your website, Tony? What was it again? Oh, blackhistorywalks.co.uk. Blackhistorywalks.co.uk. So make sure you go there. See if you can attend those walks, do some reading, but just, you know, be attentive and recognize that there comes a point where we need to move beyond just talking about things and actively putting those into practice. So with that, we come to the end of the show. Next week, as I said, we've got Brother Davis from uh, Manhood Global Academy, who's going to be on here. And we're going to be talking about the link between the black economy, um, single parent families, and youth gang culture. So you really don't want to miss that. And we will be going in and going deep. Name's Ali Shakoya. Appreciate you. And thank you. And also apologies for the hitch up we had with Facebook. For some reason, Facebook Live wasn't working this weekend, this week. Uh, but apologies uh, for Facebook's mess up. Yeah, awesome. Have a good evening. And don't forget to circulate. Take care.